one, check one, two, three, check one, one, two, three, check one. Audio check. Check one, two. Check, check, check. Choke. Nothing? Okay, hold on. Two, check two, one, two, check, check, check. Got it? All right. Welcome to the Hudson Institute. I'm Patrick Cronin, Hudson's Chair for Asia Pacific Security. And today's program is special to me. It's a byproduct of my own interest in research on maritime security, especially in the South China Sea, and especially dealing with China's so-called gray zone operations designed to further strategic goals short of the use of major force. But that's sort of an American perspective on high-end concerns. Um, when you invest time in how most countries in the vast Indo-Pacific region and around the world, that is to say our allies and partners, 
view maritime challenges, they see a constellation of traditional and non-traditional challenges, including over the international rules governing maritime behavior, but also from pirates, terrorists, traffickers, and other non-state actors and transnational criminal organizations. <clears throat> I have a new essay on this topic of maritime order being published today by the Center for International Maritime Security, but I'm here mostly, like you, to listen to the experts we've assembled, the most fertile minds thinking and writing about maritime security and political warfare. <clears throat> and let me briefly introduce them. First, Benjamin B.J. Armstrong, Assistant Professor of War Studies and Naval History at the U.S. Naval Academy, uh, is a Naval Academy graduate, a Ph.D. from King's College London. Commander Armstrong is a former search and rescue and special warfare helicopter pilot who was deployed on a wide range of global operations. That background sh should suggest to all of us why naval operations during the first 60 years of our republic may be relevant now. And yet, certainly I know too little about Captain John Paul Jones, Captain um, William Bainbridge, and Captain John Downs, and what they did off the Scottish coast, the Barbary coast, and the coast of Sumatra, respectively. That's why we have him here, to, to learn more about this. BJ's new book, Small Boats and Daring Men, Maritime Raiding, Irregular Warfare in the Early American Navy, is a brilliant injection of serious history that needs to enter our present day understanding that navies are not just about guerre de scarde, naval war via fleets and warship battles, or guerre de course, attacks on enemy commerce and trade, but also guerre de razia, war by raiding in irregular naval operations, and he'll explain this in just a minute. <clears throat> After that, we'll hear from um, Dr. Joshua Tallis, who holds a PhD from the University of St. Andrews, is a research scientist at the Center for Naval Analyses, and the author of another great new book, The War for Muddy Waters, Pirates, Terrorists, Traffickers, and Maritime Security. And here's another important contribution that should remind us that so many security challenges will take place along the world's heavily populated littoral regions, and that much of it will be unconventional in green and brown waters. And picking up where David Kilcullen left off in his excellent book, Out of the Mountains, there are critical linkages between the land and the sea. Indeed, a war for muddy waters that require a constabulary and law enforcement, Coast Guard, as much as conventional military power. After they speak about their books, we're gonna have an expert panel assembled here discuss about the current assessment of how these things relate. Um, and they're all distinguished. Dr. Peter Haynes, retired Navy captain, author of Toward a New Maritime Security, is senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. Among other assignments, Captain Haynes served as the Deputy Director of Strategy Plans and Policy at the U.S. Special Operations Command. Dr. Martin Murphy is an internationally renowned writer of maritime issues, and from his book, A Decade Ago, Small Boats in Weak States, Dirty Money, um, which, from which I learned a lot on these issues, uh, he's written so much more, including recent work on Russian hybrid warfare in the Baltic. And last, but by no means least, Linda Robinson, a prolific and award-winning author, one of the foremost writers on Special Operations Forces, and maybe the only one who's not maritime-based here uh, today, is a senior researcher at the RAND Corporation at present. Um, I'm especially excited to have her because of her current work with her RAND colleagues on uh, modern political warfare, which captures for me a great deal of the type of conflict and competition the United States faces from revisionist powers in many domains, especially maritime. So without further ado, please welcome B.J. Armstrong. Thank you so much. And, and Patrick, thank you for putting this together. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you to the Hudson team for all the hard work putting an event like this together. Really looking forward to our distinguished panel's comments later on today. Uh, I am a historian by training and, and trade as a professor, and so I will not be talking about our contemporary problems with China today. I will not be talking about Iran. I will not be talking about North Korea or, or any of other contemporary issues. Today, my goal is to provide us a little bit of deep background of the kinds of things that the United States Navy and Marine Corps have done more widely across history. The prevailing historical narrative of the U.S. Navy traces the growth of the Blue Water Force that would become the large and powerful transoceanic fleet of the late 20th century and the networked lethal battle force of the 21st century. From John Paul Jones' battle against Serapis through the frigate duels of the War of 1812 to Manila Bay to Midway, 
ship on ship or squadron on squadron engagements have come to dominate how we see our American naval history. This is true of both naval professionals and of scholars and historians. Across the late 19th and 20th centuries, historians and strategists have divided naval strategy into, and operational thinking into two dueling schools, Gare de Corse and de, uh, Gare de Scade, or translated from the French, commerce raiding and the contest of battle fleets. From Alfred Thayer Mahan or through the French thinkers of the Jeune École to modern histories of our Navy and Marine Corps, this dichotomy of naval strategy has become something of a religious dogma almost. The midshipmen in Annapolis, the mid-career officers in Newport are taught these French phrases and sometimes their focus turns out to the open ocean in thoughts of decisive sea battles. Mahan himself wrote that the best use of a navy is to find and defeat an opponent's fleet. And we have to admit that much of the history that Americans write about our navy and much of how modern officers think about its operations is refracted through a Mahanian prism. That narrative of battle fleets and dueling ships on the world's oceans certainly covers an important aspect of our American naval history. And I don't want to sound like I'm diminishing that at all. But it offers an incomplete view of that history. From the earliest days of the Republic, the Navy was involved in operations other than ship on ship, squadron on squadron, and fleet on fleet battles. It conducted these other missions on a global scale, regardless of the contemporary size or shape of the US fleet. Or, frankly, whether the United States was at war or in a time of relative peace. This other history forms an important but almost entirely overlooked element of the American naval tradition. However, in 2003, in the pages of the history journal, The Northern Mariner, historian James Bradford returned us to the experiences of John Paul Jones. And he suggested that the US Navy's father may have had another concept in mind, a third way of naval warfare. He wrote that an alternative school of naval strategy, Gerda Razia, was first advocated by John Paul Jones in 1776 and 77. And Gerderazzi is a phrase that Professor Bradford borrowed from the work of French colonial officers who were involved in North African counterinsurgency. He translates it as war by raiding. The concept has a long history in land warfare, including here in America, the colonial American experience, conflicts with the Native Americans, and the complex wars between European great powers and the Americas all involve these raiding operations ashore. Based on the planning and the discussions in John Paul Jones' correspondence, Bradford identifies at sea as, quote, a style of warfare in which the main goal of operations is not the capture or destruction of the enemy's commerce <coughs> or the defeat of his fleet, but the raiding of his coasts and colonies. This raises an interesting question for naval strategists and historians both. Could it be true? Might there be a third school of naval operational art or strategy? Bradford's article in the Northern Mariner contains this first use of Gerda Razia in a maritime context. However, it echoes the writing of the retired Royal Navy Admiral Philip Cullum from a century earlier. In the same year that Mahan published The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, Cullum published his book, Naval Warfare, Its Ruling Principles Historically Treated a delightfully 19th century title for a book. Cullum examined much of the same history that Mahan had, but he discussed a wider range of naval operations than the American tackled in his book, including a section scrutinizing the history of amphibious operations and maritime raiding. Now, Cullum broke these into two categories, operations to take and hold territory, what we today might call invasion or our modern doctrine of amphibious assault, and his second category was maritime raids of destruction, or what he called cross-ravaging. Now, the examination of raiding in Column's book highlighted its importance across the history of the Royal Navy, and it showed a regularity in raiding and irregular operations. And they were conducted in addition to, or sometimes in support of, the raiding of commerce or fleet battle. But the popularity of Mahan's book obscured all this and few read Cullum today or even know of his book's existence. Yet, 
if we're to treat guerre de Razia as a legitimate naval concept, we're going to have to dive deeper than Bradford's examination of Paul Jones' correspondence or Admiral Cullum's writing. Just as the other two styles of strategy, maritime raiding on the commerce or fleet battle, have discrete tactical and operational elements, what today we might call concepts, capabilities, or tactics, techniques, and procedures, a third school would require these same things. Their existence and support for the concept of guerre de Razia, therefore, could be best proved and developed through a study of naval irregular warfare across time. And that's what my book, Small Boats and Daring Men, set out to do. Of course, doing that across the entire span of American naval history would be a bit of a daunting task. So in keeping with Bradford's initial use of the phrase guerre de Razia, I started with John Paul Jones. And I made my trips to the archives, and I extended them through the Age of Sail era, ending as the first steam sloops joined the deploying squadrons of the US Navy in the early 1840s. The eight examples of missions and campaigns I pursue through the official records, the archives, and the personal papers of the participants suggest that not only was naval raiding conducted by the early US Navy and Marine Corps, it was a fundamental part of how American commanders executed their orders in both war and in peace. The history told in the chapters of the book suggests that, in fact, common operational and tactical patterns emerge, that these are irregular warfare operations were conducted all over the world, and they demonstrate an evolution of the Guerre de Razia concept. Beginning with John Paul Jones, raids on Whitehaven and St. Mary's in the American Revolution, the book moves through the quasi-war with France and the First Barbary War. These were conflicts in the Caribbean and the Mediterranean, they were funded by Congress. They had a nebulously worded authorization for the use of military force, but they did not have explicit declarations of war. The Navy had to construct operations with diplomacy and economics in mind. Naval commanders fought both nation state and non state actors. And they had to operate in a multinational context and worked with local actors bent on regime change. Maybe some of this sounds familiar. From there, the book spends a pair of chapters looking at the raiding and irregular operations of the War of 1812. In that conflict, a regional power with a small navy challenged the global naval hegemon. They used swarming small boats, mines, and undersea warfare in collaboration with indigenous paramilitary forces. And in doing so, they forced the big navy into changing their tactics and force protection methods. While the big navy remained tactically superior in the open ocean, the regional power could still claim a strategic victory. Maybe this sounds familiar. From there, the final three chapters of the book examine the US Navy and Marine Corps operating in archipelagic waters and in the Indo-Pacific in the 1820s and the 1830s. This time, they faced brutal non-state actors who had been declared not just criminals, but, quote, the enemies of all mankind. But they had to face these challengers in waters where great powers conducted their own operations. Sometimes these other powers had interests that aligned with the American ones. Often they had interests that were in opposition to the American ones. Issues of criminality and disruptions of the global order conflicted with sovereignty and economic considerations in the literals. This required dynamic tactical leadership, but also sound diplomatic and strategic understanding of the region. Again, maybe this sounds familiar. Long before SEALs and Marine Raiders captured the imagination of our television watching and movie going public today, the US Navy and Marine Corps were attacking pirate camps. They were launching missions in the dark of night to blow up enemy ships, and they were raiding targets ashore. The experiences of the Age of Sail combined with later examples, like the Navy and Marine Corps' involvement in the Philippine insurrection, the Yangtze patrols of the 1920s, and Operation Market Time in Vietnam, and they begin to illustrate the fact that naval irregular warfare is a wider part of American naval history. Rather than a new development, or a special element of recent postmodern naval affairs, we're talking about something that is actually quite old. So why does any of this matter? Recently, I was invited to speak at a strategy event, and I was uh, 
told beforehand that I had to make sure that I didn't just talk about history, that I had to ensure that I was quote unquote relevant. And I could spend an hour on the danger of that kind of thinking, the perils of present mindedness, uh, but I won't bore you with that today. I'll save it for my midshipmen. But today, if we're to trust the articles in Naval Institute's proceedings and the discussions in military and national security journals, the Navy and Marine Corps are wrestling with the question of how to balance the great of great power competition and its attendant battle fleet focus with the realities of gray zone or hybrid conflict or asymmetric warfare or whichever newfangled label you want to use today. While hyper-focusing on our new favorite buzzword, lethality, the nation and the Navy also find themselves needing to understand diplomacy, maritime crime and economics, naval presence, and the kind of maritime competition that happens below the threshold of open warfare. Perhaps developing a deeper understanding of the historical roots of Gerdorazia and its operational norms, its concepts, its techniques, might offer a more nuanced understanding of our history of the Navy and Marine Corps. And it might offer us a view of how navies more generally have operated across the spectrum of conflict. This might also offer a needed correction to the self-image of the US Navy as exclusively an oceanic military force built just for decisive big sea battles. <clears throat> Through a reappraisal of our Navy's formative years in the age of sail, we can recognize that the role of raiding and irregular operations are an element of the service's responsibility to the nation, both in wartime and in peacetime. And we may come to the understanding that the reality is that maritime raiding and naval irregular warfare are not irregular at all. Instead, they've always been a fundamental part of American sea power. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Cronin. Thank to the uh, Hudson Institute for having me. Uh, as Patrick mentioned, my name is Josh Tallis. I'm a research scientist at the Center for Naval Analyses. I'm here to, today to talk about both uh, my new book, The War for Muddy Waters, but also more broadly, the issue of maritime security. And, and I think it's a fascinating pairing with BJ's book because the historiography of the US Navy and the Navy historical culture has really influenced the degree to which we think about maritime security as a discipline and as an item worthy of study in and of itself. And so my talk today is going to go through uh, three primary subjects. I'm going to talk first about maritime security as a, as a general subject. Then I'm going to dive a little bit into the premise of my book specifically. And then I'll follow up with a few implications of that research and, and some takeaway points I think might be relevant for the audience. So with respect to maritime security, broadly constructed. I'll start, maybe make this a little bit autobiographical. The way I got into maritime security is the way a lot of folks do, which is studying it in graduate school. And like any good grad student, when you start a new subject, you do a literature review. And what you'll find if you do a literature review of maritime security is most folks are studying a specific topic within maritime security. Some folks are studying a specific region. A few folks are studying a specific topic within a specific region. It makes a lot of sense. These are complex issues. You can study piracy. You can study narcotics trafficking. You can study the Gulf of Guinea. You can study piracy in the Gulf of Guinea. These things, you can, you can fill an academic lifetime looking at them. But part of the challenge with that perspective is that it breeds a certain narrative about what should be done about maritime security. If you have a siloed and fragmented literature, <coughs> then the result is a counter-something approach. You talk about counter-piracy. You talk about counterterrorism. You talk about counter narcotics. Let's put that in one bucket. I approached the subject of maritime security 2012, 2013, seriously for the first time. And the prevailing literature in the US Navy at this time is a cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power. It's a little old at this point. It was published in 2007. But it remains the prevailing maritime document. In fact, it's the first significant cross-maritime service strategy that the United States put forward. So it's written jointly with the US Navy, the US Marine Corps, and the US Coast Guard. And in some senses, this is the high watermark for the concept of maritime security in the maritime forces. It's one of the, the first serious instantiations of maritime security in a strategic document. 
but it falls victim to a lot of the same issues that you saw in the academic literature. It talks about countering piracy, it talks about countering terrorism, it talks about countering narcotics trafficking. The problem with that perspective is it's obvious why those things don't belong in that other big category of things that newbies do. It is less obvious, or at least it was less obvious to me, why is that a coherent set of items that go together, right? It's understandable why they don't go somewhere else, but if you're going to bump we say something coherent about what it means to study or do maritime security, and consequently, does that mean something valuable from a strategic perspective for how the US Maritime Services or any maritime service approaches the constellation of items that fit within that bundle of maritime security? OK, that makes sense. That's, that's the world that I come to when I start studying maritime security. You might rightly say, that's not the world we live in anymore. What's happened since then, 2014, the Russian incursion into Crimea, all of a sudden NATO reimagines and, and, and uh, retains its vision about what it was founded for, has a common purpose once again in a really coherent manner. And that only starts to accelerate. 2015, the cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power undergoes a revision where you already start to see a retreat from a focus of an interest in maritime security and deference to some, some of these larger strategic issues. And then of course, 2018, the publication of the national defense strategy and the reintroduction of the concept, or specifically the buzzword, of great power competition into the, the policy landscape. So you might rightly ask, why should any of us care about maritime security when we've got bigger fresh fish to fry in 2019? And my one major argument to that point is that there is more than one trend that is operative in the world at any given moment. We should care about great power competition. If you believe in a realist interpretation of international relations, then the fundamental structure of the international system breeds the potential for conflict. If you believe in Graham Allison's theories of the, the shifting or the transitions in power dynamics, then obviously we're going to focus on, on China. If you believe in Mearsheimer's interpretation of re regional states pushing for hegemony and potentially coming to conflict with one another, you should care about great power competition. But that's not all that's happening in the world right now. There are trends that are external to the structure and external to great power competition that I argue in, in the first chapter of my book should make us pay continued attention to these lower end issues. And so uh, Dr. Cronin mentioned before, uh, this uh, is large or in some part an extension of David Kilcullen's work in Out of the Mountains. He's a counterinsurgency theorist for those who aren't familiar with his work. He proposes four megatrends that I think captures this really well. What are we going to see over the next century? Rapid population growth, increasing urbanization, higher connectedness, and all of that taking place in the littorals, what he calls littoralization. The littorals, that space right along the coast where things and events ashore can affect, affect things and events at sea, and where things and events at sea can affect things and events at shore. It's a nebulous, complicated geographic space, but increasingly relevant in the modern world. And I'll throw out one statistic that I found fascinating. In one generation, cities are expected to absorb the majority of the population growth equal to all population growth from the start of human history to 1960. That's in one generation. This is going to propose phenomenal strains, particularly on the global south, where you might not have the government's capacity to absorb that many people. That's going to have serious consequences for the type of actors that take root in those coastal spaces. We've already seen that with respect to the Houthis. We've seen that with respect to Hezbollah. With respect to Hezbollah, this has real consequences in the maritime space that we're going to have to continue to wrestle with. Uh, another interesting idea on that topic is feral cities, which is an idea I originally picked up from Richard Norton in a uh, Naval War College Review article from maybe five or ten years ago, which digs really specifically into what are the consequences when you have governance collapse, and that collapse is, that void is filled by non-state actors who, on the one hand, deliver services, but on the other hand, have a coercive capability. And that coercive capability matters because if they don't have it, they're going to be supplanted by an orga organization that is capable of leveraging some form of violence. So a power vacuum leads itself towards violent non-state groups filling that position as often as not. And ultimately, it's that connectedness, one of Kilcullen's megatrends, that brings that together. These aren't local issues. These aren't problems just for the people who live in those communities. These are problems, first and foremost, 
for the littoral space where much of this growth is taking place. And because the littoral space is so connected to the global arteries and global trade and global navies, it's gonna matter for global powers as well. One final point I'll make on, on this first subject of maritime security as a general topic, and this is, comes from a former professor of mine, uh, Richard English, who's now at Queen's University in Belfast, and he likes to say, state responses to non-state violence change history a lot more than acts of non-state violence themselves. You can think of 9-11 was a terrible tragedy for this country, but the US response to 9-11 was a paradigm shift in global politics, right? The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand was a tragedy, but the response to that was World War I, right? And states are agents in the way they respond to non-state violence. And so failure to think critically about how do you address maritime security and how do you address low-end threats in a way that is effective and in a way that doesn't overly leverage resources or overreact or underreact could be critical for the way that the United States and other major powers interact with the global system in the 21st century. So the key point from this first section about the, what is maritime security, why does it matter, is that even in an era of great power competition, it's something we should still be paying attention to. Okay, on a little bit more to the premise specifically of my, my book, operating in the maritime space is difficult. It's expensive, it takes training, it takes upkeep. So what does that mean? The preponderance of state actors in the maritime space are navies. And when they're not navies, they're large constabulary forces, often coast guards. The problem is, when you look at issues of maritime insecurity, it looks a lot more like crime than it does like war. So you have this fundamental mismatch right off the bat, where you have a state actor that is equipped and trained to look at a problem in a certain way. But the problem they're looking at isn't the problem they were equipped and trained to look at. What's the solution? What I propose is maybe crime has something to tell us about what we can do in the maritime security space. And so I pick a theory of criminology, in this case, the broken windows theory, and just explore what happens if we dig into this with a specific eye towards maritime security and see if it tells us something valuable about how navies and the major actors in the maritime space can go, in, can go about tackling issues of maritime insecurity. So just briefly, for those who are interested, Broken Windows was originally published in the Atlantic Magazine in 1982. It's an incredibly accessible article for anybody who's interested. You can just go online and find it. It is allegedly the single most read article in the entire history of the Atlantic Magazine, which is pretty incredible. If you're not interested in digging into that, uh, one of the authors, uh, George Kelling, recently passed away and the Wall Street Journal wrote a, a really phenomenal uh, obituary in which they also go into a little bit of detail on the theory. So if you're interested in digging a little bit more into that, you can do so there. But the fundamentals to broken windows, which is sort of a progenitor to a uh, modern interpretation of community policing, is it, boiled down to, to one story. And that's, if you're walking down the street and you see a building that has a broken window in it, if that window isn't repaired fairly expeditiously, the odds are the next time you pass that, that building, all the windows are gonna be broken. Why is that the case? It's not because cities have a disproportionate distribution of window lovers and window breakers. Right? The reason is that people are responding, and this is sort of the kernel of the broken windows theory, people respond to subtle cues in their environment. This is not a rational actor economist model about crime. This is people pick up signals and cues from their spaces and internalize that and act in ways that they're not necessarily aware that they're doing as a result of the signals that are around them. And so specifically in the book, I pull two threads from my investigation of broken windows to see what can we get from this. And the first really speaks to that context orientation, that crime happens in a context and is context dependent. So one example from the criminology literature is the New York City subway system. New York City subway in the, late in the early 90s in New York was crime-ridden, it was dirty, it was breaking down constantly. You can read a lot of this in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Tipping Point, where he does a really great job of painting this picture. And the point is, the MTA tackles this problem in two stages. First, they address graffiti, an obvious signal of disorder, and then they address fare beating, another obvious signal of disorder. What happens as a consequence? Crime on the subways plummets. By addressing signals of disorder, you see an overall decrease in crime and insecurity in that space. So one of the salient points that I pull out here is, 
how do we go about making sure we're not ignoring the social spaces in the strategies that we construct? The phrase ignoring the social spaces is something I pull from a, a small wars journal article about the Mumbai attacks, which I think is instructive for thinking about, again, how do we pull themes from things that are happening on land and apply them in a crime-oriented maritime security context? I'll come back to that in a little bit. The second major point, and this took a little bit more digging, is that crime is multidimensional. And we know this intuitively. You don't hear anybody talking about a counter-burglary strategy or a counter-murder strategy. We talk about tackling crime because we understand that in some coherent sense, crime is a thing that can be talked about and addressed. And it's the same idea that I'm trying to bring towards maritime security. We can talk about countering piracy. We can talk about countering terrorism. We can talk about countering narcotics and human trafficking. But how do we talk about the coherence of maritime insecurity. And again, we can see this in the example of the New York City subway system. So not only in the course of addressing signal disorders like graffiti and fare beating does crime decrease, but what police see is that about one in six or one in seven folks that are picked up for fare beating have an outstanding arrest either for a felony or a class A misdemeanor. There's an ecosystem to criminality and insecurity. And by addressing that ecosystem, you can have outsized effects, not just on the individual crime that you're addressing, but on the constellation of crime that exists in that space. I think this has profound implications in a maritime security environment, and we don't know enough about this. But we have a few examples. For example, there's likely an interplay between illegal, unreported, and unregulated, or IUU, fishing, and piracy. We don't know enough about that, but we know that there's a relationship there. Likewise, there's a relationship between IUU fishing and human trafficking. And there's some good work that the International Labor Organization has done about a decade ago, putting out a phenomenal report exploring this. We know that there's a relationship between gun running, narcotics trafficking, and cash smuggling in the Caribbean. Those networks are related to one another. And we know that there's a relationship between illegal oil bunkering or oil theft and insurgency in Nigeria. And that there's a great quote that's it's a bit of a stylized example, but it really speaks to the fundamentals of this from a former governor of uh, Nigeria's river state, which says, someone might, quote, one day kidnap an oil worker in order to buy a flashy car. The next day, he may join a raid by a militant group, and on the third day, hijack a rig to generate cash for his chief or to get jobs for his community. There's a fundamental understanding in the communities that are addressing these issues that maritime security is multidimensional, is that the way we address that from a policy perspective in Washington? Finally, an element of broken windows that I think is valuable is it can also explain the dangers of getting this wrong. Keeping in mind the idea of context, here's where it gets tricky. Your tool is a military tool. Your theory is a, is a policing theory. The dangers of militarizing a fundamentally criminal problem can have huge consequences. There's something that David Kilcullen pulls out called herbicide. When you take an overly militarized approach to an insurgency or a crime problem in a city, you can create a fortress mentality. And us against them, where the very people that you as an authority are trying to help are rebelling against you because of the aggressive nature in which you're going about it. And the challenge here becomes, how do you police with the community and not against the community in a maritime space where your actors are fundamentally military actors? So the end of this second stage, the key point that I want to take away is that there is a real value in taking the criminal and criminology lens to maritime security, and it produces interesting and, I hope, valuable perspectives on treating the, the strategic issue. And the final stage, talking about some implications here, I, I break these into two categories. The first is for uh, the research and the academic community. And, and the first of the points that I'll break out there is uh, maritime security is a coherent subject, but we need to address it as a subject more specifically. It is important to break it into its component parts, but we need to talk more about what does it mean from a strategic and a disciplinary lens to think about maritime security. And the second element here is, given we're living in a world where we, we broadly appreciate that there's a less binary perspective between the divide of, of war and peace, we need to find a better way to integrate maritime security issues and thinking into the broader perspective on competition and its role in global power politics. And then for practitioners and strategists, which I assume are many folks here in this room, I'll pull out three very quick points. The first I've mentioned, <laughs> balancing military capability with a policing theory is valuable but difficult. And getting it wrong can have incredibly di disastrous consequences, both for the, 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 uh, the, the perspective and the vision of the, the organizations that are perpetuating it, in this case, US Navy, US Maritime Powers, 
but also for the communities that are living these experiences. And then with respect to the two threads that I pull through the book, for multidimensionality, one important takeaway we can have is it's okay to follow the local lead. There are often cases where the U.S. interest in maritime security does not match that of the local state. We could take an example, for example, Indonesia, where there much, might be a much higher interest in IUU fishing than in counter piracy. The United States with the emphasis on counter piracy in that example. It might be the case that follow the local lead, pay more attention to IUU fishing. You're going to get credible, strong local buy-in but it's also going to have downstream consequences on what you're truly interested in. And then with respect to context, I would say it's important not to ignore social spaces in our strategies. And specifically in an era of great power competition, it is valuable not to think of low-end competition as secondary to geopolitics, but central to our construction of the political narrative that is so central to the idea of great power competition. And so what I want to leave you with now are sort of my bumper sticker for, for the book and for this talk, which is partnerships matter, people matter, and perspectives matter. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Pete Haynes. I'm a non-resident senior fellow at, uh, at CSB, uh, a couple blocks away. Uh, I want to thank first of all Patrick and, and Hudson uh, for sponsoring what I think is really needed innovative thinking, um, and, and I'll explain a, a couple of the reasons why um, and, uh, and 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 what the implications of these of these books are. So I want to start out kind of broad and then kind of work my way uh, back in. So the first question is why are these books important? Why is the age of sale and the, re and the regular warfare important on one side? And, and why is um, you know, muddy waters, crime, and the littorals uh, important on, on the other side? And let me first start with a quote from John Hattendorf um, from 1984. It says, the fixation with decisive actions at sea was simple-minded and distracted strategists from seriously examining alternative uses of sea power that were appropriate to the geographic and strategic circumstances of the situation they faced. So what situation are we faced with right now? We are faced with not only uh, great power competition, but a return to maritime great power competition, particularly in the form of China. This is the first time since Imperial Japan where we've had a maritime competition. Uh, the Soviet Union put very little to see it valued, pretty much only, only SSBNs. It was isolated from the world economy. It was isolated from the sources of innovation and, uh, and funding. Uh, China is part and partial of, our, of our, the economic system that the United States built after, the political and economic system that the United States built after the, after the end of the Second World War. But we're also seeing with China is, is something that, that the Soviet Union did, but not only in the maritime, but, but broader and more comprehensive in, their, in, their, in the coordinated use of the instruments of power. And that is China is competing across more fields of competition than the Soviet Union ever did. They're competing economically, socially, politically. Um, the, the, the amount of competitive, the amount, the amount of competitions is, is, is multiplying. And of course, a lot of that is enabled by globalization. We live in an era of globalization. Um, the previous era of globalization ended with the, with the start of the First World War. And we're about that time right now when, uh, in this era of globalization, uh, when the First World War uh, started. So uh, the repeal of the Corn Laws in, in 1846 essentially uh, let loose the free world, uh, 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 sorry, the, the free trade revolution. And uh, at that point, every nation on earth uh, was extremely vulnerable um, and it was, was extremely reliant to access to the seas, uh, none more so than the, than the United Kingdom in the First World War. So um, what we're seeing now is, 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 is the, these competitions spreading. And one of the problems that I see with the U.S. Navy is it has defined the competition very narrowly. It has defined it within the confines of the operational level of war and pretty much in terms of anti-access and error denial. 
and why are they doing that? Well, in a lot of, as, as BJ said, a lot of ways that is actually kind of reflecting the Navy's self-identity, that we're a blue water Navy, that we only do um, uh, fleet on fleet actions and we only do uh, decisive battle. And go back to John Hando's uh, question, um, we have a different set of circumstances that we did during the Cold War um, and, a, and a different set of circumstances that we had in, in the Second World War. So um, that's the reasons why um, the, these books are important. So I want to dig first, um, first on history and then on uh, theory building, theory making. So um, I'm a naval historian, but I'm also a strategist. So I am the kind of guy who, um, for me, a, a, a history is, is, a, is applied history. And um, for those who saw, Hal Brands is, is at CSBA, and I think about six months ago or so, he put out an article on the, on the um, on the suicide of the discipline of history, that is not doing two things it needs to do. Um, uh, it is not being accessible to the public and is not addressing fundamental questions faced by policymakers and, and, and strategists. So I, I think what, uh, what we need is more of more history, more, more research into these kind of questions. The problem is the United States is, is, is ahistorical, if not anti-historical. Sure, naval history is kind of burgeoning in terms of battles and operational levels of war, but in broader questions of, of maritime thinking and so forth, there's not a whole a lot of, of, of naval history uh, out there. So there is, there, there is a lack of applied naval history that is now needed as we move, now is needed, is, is, is now more needed because we're moving back into an era of not only great power competition, but, but maritime great power competition. So if history is the core reserve for evidence and analysis on strategy, technology, tactics, we're doing a very poor job of delving that mine. The second part, and this is this is this is kind of wrapping up here because I want to see some time for questions, and that is theory building. What Josh's book represents um, brilliantly is the introduction of uh, of theory making back into maritime. Uh, strategic thinking. So where BJ's book uh, is brilliant in, in how um, he researches a regular warfare and uh, theorizes generally on the, the need for an awareness of Gerda Razia, uh, Josh is really is making a, an innovative uh, theory. Now the problem with theory uh, in the U.S. Navy is the Navy is not really known for theory making, particularly outside the operational level of war. Um, the Turner Revolution, uh, Admiral Stansfield Turner, the Turner Revolution in, uh, in the, in the mid-1970s at the Naval War College uh, was a revolution that was greatly needed, but essentially the Navy is so pragmatic that their theories essentially reflected what they did. And, and so that was the theory that, that the Navy's four missions were sea control, power projection, uh, nuclear deterrence and, and forward presence. Well, that, that's essentially what the Navy did. That wasn't, they, they really answered more the how question uh, and, and not the why question. Um, and the other problem was is that the Cold War really uh, pushed strategic thinking in the United States towards highly rational, hyper rational thinking that, that soon became divorced from, from, from policy considerations. And um, and it all became deterrence and so forth. And uh, there was a frenzied preoccupation in the, in the Cold War um, in developing theoretical approaches to the three most central ideas of strategic theory, deterrence, limited war, and arms control, all quarter of which had been avoided because there was a massive history uh, before then that was not dealt because most of the strategic theories in the United States in the early Cold War were economists, physicians, uh, and, and so forth. So what Josh is begging implicitly is we need more, and what I'm saying explicitly is we need more capabilities to do this kind of theory making to be able to fill the gap um, and, and be able to broaden our understanding beyond anti-access and area denial to both of these sides. And um, I, I, unlike Josh, I do not divorce great power competition from, from maritime security. In a globalized era, everything is so interconnected and interdependent you cannot afford to be able to reduce things uh, like that. Um, so my comments were really more towards the conceptual challenges and not the capability challenges because with most discussions like this, 
um, most of the question answer periods will, will devolve into a question of capabilities, which again reflects the fact that um, uh, uh, McNamara in the 1960s changed the dialectic of strategy in American strategic thinking from ends, means, may, ends ways, means dialectic to a profound focus on the means uh, of warfare, and we are still uh, struggling with that under the, underneath the shadow of the, of the Cold War. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Martin Murphy. Thank you to Patrick for inviting me. Uh, to this panel. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to come out, actually, because I now spend most of my life talking and thinking about great power conflict in terms of China and Russia, but I started my life uh, looking at piracy, which I have to say has raised a certain level of skepticism amongst people that this is not the right door to take into naval and maritime strategy. I've always argued that history was on my side, and I'm, I'm glad to see the panel sort of agrees with me. However, I've got very little time, so I want to concentrate uh, just on Joshua's book, uh, which he knows I like because I said so on the back of the cover, so I can't back off from that now. Now, Patrick asked me to talk about whether or not the U.S. is prepared uh, for the challenges that Joshua describes and to take on board the burdens he suggests are needed to address the problems in the littorals. So I want to answer that from a, from a, a big picture perspective. Uh, but to cut to the answer, in case I run out of time, no. I do not believe the U.S. is prepared for either. The essential reason uh, is simple, uh, because the sea means next to nothing for most modern Americans, and consequently about sea power and the importance of the sea in our economy and the importance of the sea in our way of life. It has lost almost all traction at the levels of politics and policy. And if the sea means next to nothing, then the idea of a maritime domain, which embraces the land that touches upon the sea, as well as the sea itself, is even more elusive. The point is, is that the US has one by one shared the economic, financial, and commercial and industrial interests, and thus the political interests that create and sustain the broader meaning of sea power. Its interest in the sea is dominated by military and security concerns. Now, of course, across the American continent, there are islands of maritime interest, shipyards and fishing communities and oceanographic research and woods hold, and so on and so forth. But despite the increasing economic and political importance of the maritime domain, they lack political attention and policy coherence. Now, I heard uh, Tim Walton, um, and another CSBA colleague, or when I was after my time in one studio there, uh, summed this up brilliantly a few weeks ago uh, when he said, and I think I heard this right, that the US has embarked on an historically unprecedented experiment to be a naval power without being a maritime power, if you like, to possess a fleet without a hinterland. Now, this was brought home to me most forcibly when I was writing on piracy, Somali piracy. Uh, specifically, and observing the USN's almost total lack of understanding of the political and strategic implications of what was happening, which was about much more than men in boats and many frail boats wearing rags, and the misery they inflicted on, on seafarers. It was about shifts in political power that accompanied changes in the meaning and importance of maritime security, disturbances related as much to technological change and the US-led move away from a system of oceans governance based on global empires to ones based on international institutions than it was about a single fragile state. And it also says so much about what BJ was saying about the distance between the Navy we have now and the Navy we had before. Uh, and also, um, it also captures what um, Joshua's point about the, le the state response in this case, the US state response to piracy, or rather the non-response uh, that happened. Simply put, navies throughout history have used piracy or fought piracy to advance state interests or impair those of their competitors. The architects of the 2000 cooperation, cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power, which has been mentioned already, understood that the United States Navy did not, but China did and its understanding has only deepened and broadened since then. Now, Joshua captured an essential part of this when he wrote in his book 
that the role of the Navy is to deter and, if need be, win large-scale conflicts without adding at sea. In many ways, he is right to, add, uh, to leave out those two words because the Navy is now just one component of the joint force. As a, a part of this larger construct, the sea is a medium to project US power onto land. Uh, much of the special and necessary affinity between the Navy and the physical media medium that sustains it has been lost, and with it, the connection to the economic medium that kept it afloat. The littorals are obstacles to be overcome or overflown, not areas of opportunity or for engagement. Joshua captures this contrast well. He writes about the growth of coastal cities, which interests me, and I would suggest should interest anyone who regards maritime and naval power as important, because they possess hinterlands that extend out to sea as much as they extend back into the continental spaces. He begins by talking about urban sprawl and feral cities and the security threats and governance uh, concerns to which this mass of humanity has given rise and is, will continue to do so, but he readily acknowledges their economic power and political importance. And uh, it is at this point that the American lack of a coherent maritime strategy fails it. Where the US sees security problems, China sees economic opportunity. Joshua rightly talks about the need for a unified theory of maritime security, but more than that, we need a unified theory of maritime engagement. He rightly points out the broken windows, the crime-busting theory that he champions has a powerful economic rationale. Crime, after all, is often an economic phenomenon before it becomes a moral one. China has an alternative approach to maritime engagement and the economic environment of the littorals. It builds ports and other things. We need to ponder the difference between the two. Joshua's book is a useful way, as he writes, to jumpstart the conversation on that and what that means. And one final point, uh, another link uh, to, um, to the pre-Mahanian Navy that BJ talks about of commerce and coastal defense. The Navy of Robert Schufelt and Matthew Perry uh, would have understand the marriage between economic and security of dimensions of the naval service perfectly. I'll leave it there, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Patrick. I am uh, very pleased to be invited to join this conversation. And as Patrick noted, uh, I am not a maritime expert, and this conversation should be rightly focused on that specific subset. Uh, but I was invited to contribute some broader thoughts about irregular warfare and U.S. Uh, and allied responses to that. Um, I first would like to compliment uh, these two authors, and, and I think they're just excellent and extremely timely uh, pieces of scholarship. And timely not just for literally the current events with Iran in the Gulf, but what, for, what former Secretary of Defense uh, Jim Mattis colorfully called this era of skirmishing in which we live. I think um, also I have one small anecdote about my time with the Navy SEALs at the beginning of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, they, they had been involved, of course, in many defensive operations supporting uh, the development around the world of Special Operations Forces in Colombia, uh, <coughs> recently in Africa, quite a long while in the Philippines. But in OIF, uh, they were uh, very much engaged in some of the activities that BJ might uh, recognize uh, in terms of the Go Platz operation off the uh, shores of Iraq and also the clearing and boarding of the waterways, um, including the uh, Shat al Arab, which is the small waterway between uh, Iran and Iraq. So we do have, of course, within the Navy. Uh, an element that has, I would argue, been entirely historically focused on irregular warfare. And when I was uh, picked up on the small coastal uh, Coast Guard base on the edge of Kuwait to embark on my uh, few days with them, the uh, folks who picked me up in a rib, a rigid hull inflatable boat amid a raging sandstorm over the water, which was quite something to uh, experience, 
uh, the, the guys shouted at me, whatever you say, don't call us SEALs. Of course, they were special warfare combat crewmen, and they were very rightly proud of their uh, suite of skills and their suite of craft, which I had a chance to spend uh, time on over the coming days, the RIBS, the SOC Rs, they brought their riverine craft out, and the Mark V. So, so I just wanted to, to note that they, uh, not only do they exist, but they, I think, have been uh, working very hard to contribute to what I'm going to talk about now, which is a broader uh, response to this era of skirmishing. And I do read, in, if you read the National Defense Strategy, it is not uh, just about preparing for uh, major combat operations or investing in major platforms in order to deter that major conflict, but recognizing that there is a strategic competition underway with the primary adversaries and that irregular warfare is in fact part of what they are doing and what the U.S. needs to get about. And it calls out specifically China, Russia, and Iran, but it's also uh, the case that uh, what I'm going to argue in a few brief moments, uh, state and non-state actors, at least those actors that are sufficiently empowered and possess the capabilities of quasi-states, uh, can employ a suite of tactics. Uh, and I might differ just a little bit, quibble a little bit with uh, my good friend uh, Peter, that I do think the Soviet Union did employ a wide array of tactics, and it certainly employed proxy warfare and so forth during the Cold War. But I would just argue more broadly this phenomenon that I'm describing as irregular warfare has a diplomatic political component, informational and increasingly now cyber, and the military intelligence activities as well as economic and financial. So it's really about adversaries that have become very adept at empl employing that full suite of tactics uh, to either subvert, destabilize, or co-opt. In essence, compromise sovereignty of other countries. And this is what I think in the uh, national defense strategy, there is um, uh, perhaps a, a less recognition publicly of the need to craft a response to this. There is, however, and many of you may not know, uh, within the Pentagon, there's something called the Office of Irregular Warfare. Uh, so there actually is an entity, and it has been chugging along since Peter and I were both helping a government effort uh, produce something called the Irregular Warfare Joint Operating Concept in 2010, trying to galvanize the entire, not only DOD enterprise, but the government, interagency actors, as well as our allies and partners, uh, to... Um, develop the toolkit and apply it in a coherent way uh, to get after this uh, type of threat. So fast forward to uh, last year, we uh, at RAND with my colleagues, a, very, a great group of researchers uh, that I led, we published a volume called Modern Political Warfare, Current Practices and Possible Responses. And we, we took uh, a, a, the problem on in the following way. We were asked to examine the utility of the uh, term political warfare, which was a George Kennan term used in the Cold War. So we uh, initiated the study looking at the uh, practices that the U.S. Uh, employed in the Cold War, and yes, primarily against uh, the Soviet uh, Union, which was employing its own suite. And then from that, we took it forward to say what types of practices, analogous practices, are, uh, and we used Russia and Iran as our state ca cases, and we looked at ISIS as the non-state case. And from those very deep case studies, we extracted a, a list of attributes that we considered co uh, con consisting of modern, comprising modern political warfare today. And, and the, the China case, which should be in the book, and that's certainly, you can look across that dime spectrum and see, yes, it's heavily economic in many of its tools, but certainly the South China Sea activities and the aid is the, the um, trying to expand its air uh, zone. These are emblematic uh, boundary stretching activities that both extend its own reach and undermine or challenge international or its sovereign rights. With the Russian variants very heavy on informational and intelligence and covert operations, but also, as we've seen, a very opportunistic uh, use of force short of conventional warfare 
uh, to note uh, the recent Black Sea events, its, its leveraging of armed sales, foreign advisors, uh, um, mercenaries such as the Wagner Company, uh, and energy in, in the service of this concerted uh, campaign. And finally, Iran, very, very deft uh, actor in the employment of soft power and very uh, famous for its use of uh, proxies. But as we uh, point out in this uh, case study, this should be rightly understood as not just military actors, but uh, military actors who become political actors, as we have seen in Lebanon, now in Iraq, and they're very deft at using social and economic pro programs, as well as informational programs to uh, uh, forge their inroads. So I would just like to suggest that we, uh, in our final chapter, we suggest this has to be a whole of government uh, response. And the President of the United States, because of the way the interagency community is designed, he must appoint a lead within the government to orchestrate this whole of government response. Uh, as I mentioned, there are people at work. They, there is an IW annex, an irregular worker annex to the uh, NDS, and it calls out roles for all the services, which is a great way for someone to take BJ's book and update uh, some of those TTPs in the current environment and uh, put them, uh, put the Navy's um, uh, on notice that they need to uh, really have a very elaborated plan uh, to get after this. And I would just uh, call out in the Cold War, the Department of State had a very important role and uh, we explore some of the need, uh, the needs to have the diplomatic and informational pieces uh, receive uh, maximum attention because we are heavily underpowered and losing that aspect of the fight. Thank you. Well, thank you all. What terrific presentations. We have some time for, for Q&A, and um, I want to just turn right to it rather than me sort of dominate the question. Yes, sir, we'll start down here, and then we'll go over here. There's a microphone coming. This man in the second row. I'm sorry, this one first. We'll, we'll get back to this gentleman then. You'll be third, sir. <laughs> Hi, George Knuckles from the Washington Liaison for the Global Special Operations uh, uh, Command Foundation. I helped stand up SOCOM. Uh, one of the questions, and I was a little surprised it wasn't referred until Linda got to talk, but you know that the Navy established the Navy Expeditionary Combat Command years ago, and their charter was place the Navy forces when they are most needed the most and establish new capabilities in support of maritime security operations. That's exactly what you're talking about. They've also established the Coastal Riverine Force using Mark VI patrol boats. Uh, the other key thing is, I don't know if you're probably familiar with it, on June the 19th, the Congressional Research Service published a report, the name of it is Navy, IW, and CT Operations, uh, Background and Issues for Congress. It's an 80-page report, and it goes into detail with a lot of things that have been done, that aren't being done, and should be done. Comments? We want to take a couple questions. This is a great question, so I mean, we could we, we could start there. But let me just, let's just hear from these other two gentlemen first, and then we'll take another round of questions. This gentleman in the front, and then the one in the back. Uh, hello, my name is Chris Orr. I am a uh, policy and strategy analyst, contracted in support of the DoD. Also, a former Air Force officer and a former Customs and Border Protection officer at Los Angeles Seaport. So I got a little bit of hands-on operational experience in maritime security. Uh, the question I'm, act, I'm asking on behalf of my section chief, um, I guess be primarily directed toward Dr. Murphy, although I certainly welcome input from the other panelists as well. Uh, Martin, you mentioned how the Navy is a component of the joint operation. Along those lines, you know, the Navy, in particular since 9-11, has been primarily a maneuvering and striking force assisting the boots on the ground, i.e. assisting the land flight. Well, now that we're refocusing on a maritime adversary, what are the sister services doing to, to affect maritime fight and you know, basically return the favor to the Navy after what we've been doing for them these past 17 years? Another good question. Hold on to that, sir. Yes, we'll take your third question, then we'll go to the panel. Thank you. My name is Agung from the Embassy of Indonesia. I work for the Embassy. So, uh, you know, recently, uh, in the recent two, year, two or three years, there is an escalation of the piracy activity in Philippines between uh, the Sulu Sea between Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia. So uh, my question to Josh and also for uh, Peter, uh, what's the best advice 
can you uh, can you give the can you can get you advice to the uh, Pentagon officials uh, to address those kind of issues? Thank you. Thank you very much. Why don't we go back to the panel? Maybe BJ, starting with a history of the Navy's special operations forces, and 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 then other others who want to talk about what needs to be done. So I'll, I'll start my uh, brief comment with uh, pointing out that uh, the opinions I express are mine and mine alone and are presented in my academic and personal capacity and do not reflect the United States Naval Academy, the United States Navy, or the U.S. government. Yeah. <laughs> I was supposed to make that announcement, by the way. That was my fault. That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. Before I start commenting on contemporary things, I need to make sure that it, that is abundantly clear. Um, uh, as a, as a uh, former uh, helicopter pilot, I've done a lot of work with folks uh, in the Navy special operations world. Um, and I think one thing that I'd like to point out from the, from the history as a historian, because uh, both Linda brought it up and the question kind of brings it up, um, and that is the specialness of the way we think about irregular warfare today. Um, in, in the book, in the history that's related in the book from the age of sail, there's nothing special going on. These are what we would call today the general purpose force. Um, uh, you know, by our definition of special operations today, doctrinally, uh, they are forces that are specially trained, specially equipped to achieve, and, and I'm going to flub the direct quote, right, the, but to achieve uh, strategic or uh, operational uh, aims ashore from a naval context. Um, in the book, in the chapters in the book, these are not special operators. There is not anything special about these folks. These are Marines and sailors who happen to be serving on board Navy ships, using what happens to be the equipment at hand for them to do the job that they consider just doing their job. Um, and so I, I think I, I raised that, you know, the, the quintessential example, a lot of special warfare operators like to point at uh, Stephen Decatur raiding Tripoli Harbor during the Barbary War to burn the Philadelphia you know, antecedents of the SEALs, I agree with that. It is antecedents. It is not a special operation, though, because uh, these were just sailors who Decatur said, hey, you want to go? And the sailors and Marines said, yep, let's go. And they volunteered, and they went. And they said, do we need special equipment? And they said, no, grab the cutlasses and the guns we have already and put them on board this ship that we captured, and we're going in. You know, there was no special training time. There was no special preparation or rehearsal or any of that kind of stuff. So I just want to point out that... Um, you know, the, the, there are very important things that our special operations folks do in the world today, but there are a very small number of people uh, and a very small number of units, and if, if we rely on them exclusively to address irregular challenges at sea, there will never be enough of them, and they will never be able to cover down on the problems that are out there. And a view back at our history to say, you know what, general purpose forces used to do some of this kind of stuff uh, might be valuable for us to consider today. Other comments on any of the questions? But Linda, go ahead. You want on this one? I would just like to endorse everything BJ said, and I'm, I'm sure George would, would agree. And our, I neglected to say in my remarks uh, that the Irregular Warfare Office in the Pentagon and this enterprise uh, is absolutely aimed at getting the general purpose forces from all the services oriented to exactly these types of things. Unfortunately, uh, it previously when an irregular warfare uh, directive was put out by the department, it was largely seen as, oh, that's all stuff soft does. And it was the services that did not want right. uh, to take this on. So I just think the, the while special operations may have some niche missions, in fact, we've seen in many places they're operating as a blended force, and I would argue there are probably many scenarios in which they, they need that force multiplication. And Peter, on this issue? Uh, quick, uh, quick response. Um, if you're part of the special operations community, uh, you, you know that, that naval special operations, the SEALs, have a very kinetic point of view of the world, <laughs> um, particularly compared to the Green Berets, the SF guys, the special forces guys. Matter of fact, uh, the Navy doesn't do a good job of theory making. Special Forces doesn't really do a good th job of theory making, uh, apart from uh, General Cleveland and a lot of what, what he did at, at, uh, at, at Army Special Operations Command. Matter of fact, um, the, the most, um, uh, the, the book that, that many people point to in terms of naval uh, of special operations theory is Admiral McRaven's book, uh, which he did at, naval, at the Naval Postgraduate School. And even and even in his definition, he does not include things like political warfare, irregular warfare, 
and thing, other things that the Green Berets were essentially uh, 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 built for. Um, and in a lot of ways, irregular warfare has, uh, uh, or the, the focus of special operations has been, has been on COIN and CT uh, for so long that when now SOCOM is, is now opening the aperture to, to, to great power competition, they're like, and, and there was a lot of thinking about what do we did during the Cold War? And so it goes back to, again to we need to mine history because there is an immense amount of history both on the SEALs, uh, on special forces, um, uh, about how we can use history uh, to, to inform theory developing to, to handle some of the problems, the challenges that we have right now. Thank you. Martin. Yes, I wanted to say something about the Naval Expeditionary Combat Command, which I spent some, some time with. I always thought that was a wonderful uh, initiative. It, was, it had huge utility within the, within the gambit of flanking sergeantry and so forth. But I'm surprised it still exists because nobody was paying much attention to it. It had very few friends. Uh, nobody in the Navy was really interested in it. And I also wasted part of my life supporting the Naval Irregular Warfare Office. Again, another stillborn initiative uh, which really didn't get anywhere. In fact, I wrote an article, it must be over 10 years ago, it was written in relation to this, the, the point that Peter's just made about uh, the Green Berets, that the Navy really needed a force like the Blue Berets, I called them the Blue Berets, who were going to go into these littoral uh, uh, areas and perform similar functions. That article got nowhere as well, but um, yes, I, I, I take your point, uh, but we're now living in a, in, a, in a sort of different era where we have to look at uh, general purpose forces capable of doing this and that the aperture that the general purpose force uh, has to take of the world, I would argue, is even bigger than, possibly with the exception of Pete, most of my colleagues around here. Do you want to say something about the second or third question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a, a great question. Uh, it, goes th it goes back to the point uh, that not only do we have a maritime great power competitor in China, but we also live in an era of globalization. So every nation on Earth is profoundly dependent on access to the seas. 65% um, of physical goods uh, move over uh, by volume, move over the seas, uh, and now service-oriented uh, is now makes up a, a much greater part of the economy than before. And of course, 90% um, of information moves under undersea cables or so. So, um, from, from from that perspective, so you would think that the services would be would, would be able to take a look at that and go, boy, sea control is now more important. Well, sea control kind of exists only in a time of wartime by definition, and then you tend to have maritime security in, in peacetime competition. Um, so you see some of the services, you see the Army has really moved out in terms of multi-domain operations, um, but that is still from a, a more of an anti-access air denial, and, then they're, and of course they're kind of opening their, their aperture as well. Uh, the Marine Corps, um, as is their want, is, the, is, is at the leading edge of, of conceptual thinking, uh, and um, the Air Force is very good, but the Air Force kind of connects itself to technology. Uh, matter of fact, I just wrote a proposal um, about three months ago or so on why, if we get into a, if we get into a fight with uh, of China, or if we want to deter China more, that, that the Air Force will need to take a much larger role in sea control, even, um, even far greater than what they did in the Second World War. More times than not, when the Air Force is asked to come into this, or the, or the, or the predecessors, have come in and asked to do something with sea control, they don't want to do it. Um, they they, they kind of push it off, but in the anti-submarine campaign of the, uh, of the First World War, we needed long-range Air Force bombers. Uh, and, and really the most, one of the most successful uh, sea control operations ever was the last five months of, of the Second World War, when uh, 20th Air Force B-29s uh, mined uh, Japanese harbors and slots and it, and it decimated them. So you would think that the Air Force would go, boy, we need to, we need to stop thinking about power projection and thinking about, and thinking about war at, at sea more, and, and, and they're not doing that. Peter, we're gonna be back here on uh, July 9th with the Indonesian ambassador and historians talking about 70 years of US-Indonesian relations and talking about future policy with, with Randy Shriver and, and other officials. But Josh, I wonder whether you wanted to say something about the, the fact in the in the Sulu Sea where you've had Indonesia trying to cooperate on maritime domain awareness with the Philippines, Malaysia, now trying to move to, to shore and on land, but that's a big challenge for the limited capability, and is that military is moving on shore because what's the constabulary role, what's the law, what's the military role? Is there any advice out of your book that you might apply to this in particular? Yeah, so so I'll, I'll first preface, I'm not a, a regional expert, so take take that to, you know, to some measure of a grain of salt, but it, it, pulling from at least the theory building element of, of what my work has done, one big suggestion I'd have is consider what you get by moving away from a counter threat narrative. Is it piracy specifically that is problematic or what is that a manifestation of? It's become fashionable to say 
that piracy is a manifestation of instability ashore. But dig deeper into that. You know, one thing, this reminds me of, a, of conversations we have on transnational organized crime, where it when you use phrases like that, it becomes a nebulous problem set. But the reality is, no crime is transnational. It all happens somewhere, right? This is happening inside individual communities. Individual acts of criminality happen in places. And so I think there's a potential role from a law enforcement perspective on a community policing approach where you embrace the community. Who knows better what's happening in your community, what looks wrong, what is degrading your security and your ability to make a living or to pull resources from the ocean or to gather protein and fish for food. It's the people that live there. And so finding ways to, first of all, operate ashore, but make sure that you're doing so in a way that is collaborative and not necessarily needs to focus on, on the piracy elements. I, I mentioned before that from a state level, we often have this, this juxtaposition where the United States is interested in a given threat, usually piracy, mostly piracy because we conflate it with terrorism, and then a, a local state is interested in something else. But the same is true at an enforcement level within states and communities. The community might not be most concerned with piracy, but it might be concerned with something that has an adjacency to piracy that can both enlist the local community to participate in an enforcement, what the criminology liter refer literature refers to as, as building self-efficacy, a community's willingness to police and enforce laws and rules by itself to some regard, and to see what efficiencies that can generate downstream with respect to piracy. So there might be some, some value to that. Martin, did you want to add a, a word on that at all, or we can go to the next round? Of, so another round of questions. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Those three questions, please. Got three hands up. Thanks to the group, uh, Otto Kreischer with Sea Power Magazine. Uh, to adjust to this idea of irregular warfare uh, in juxtaposition with the global competition, great power competition, it's a question of, of training and equipment. You know, uh, as Jay pointed out, you know, the old Navy had, did a lot of, of small boat operations. The Navy's always been very reluctant to buy anything s smaller than a battleship. Uh, you know, in, in Vietnam, we, we developed the green, the blue water, uh, uh, brown water Navy because we had, there was a, there was a need for it. As soon as the war was over, we pretty well, you know, ditched that. Does the Navy need to do more in the way of, of smaller uh, uh, vessels to, to deal with this, this broader range of, of, uh, of particularly conflict? And what about, you know, training, you know, can, do, do, other than, the, uh, the SEALs and the, the special boat operators and, and Expeditionary Combat Command, do, do we need to give the general purpose Navy more training in how to handle the, uh, these kind of irregular ops? Thank you. And when we, you, if you haven't read BJ's book, you'll know that we've been debating that for 220 plus years, but <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Could you tell us more about the Office of Irregular Warfare in the Pentagon? <laughs> Is it new? Has it been around for a while? Is it adequately staffed, resourced? Is the head of it somebody senior enough to be taken seriously with appropriate access in order to get his point, his or her points of view across? Yeah, and maybe Linda, related to that question, you know, and back to your last meeting, you know, are they able to deal with the breadth of issues that the public would think about irregular warfare as opposed to maybe how they define them specifically within the bureaucracy? But that's another, I don't want to get into the definition debate with you again, but yes, sir. Back here, third question. Mike's coming. Thank you. I was wondering to what extent you think the U.S. Navy needs to take a step back and maybe let other countries around the world engage in securing trade routes and such things. And related to that is, of course, the capacity building of these countries, and that's one of the things that's going on. And thinking of the Indonesia case, I mean, we don't lash up well. If we send our Navy to deal with what's really their Coast Guard, whether it's called a Navy or a Coast Guard, it's a big challenge. So it's, it's a long-term issue. Why don't we just go in the entire panel, starting with BJ, and any final summing up as well as answering these questions? So I'll, I'll, give, um, I'll give some history again, and I'll let my fellow panelists comment on the contemporary. Um, so the, the idea, from the history, there's an example in the book, which is the counter-piracy campaign that occurs in the Caribbean in the the late 18-teens and 1820s. Uh, and I think it speaks to two things. First, uh, Otto's question. And, and second, this 
this idea that we've been dancing around that somehow the irregular challenge is different from the great power challenge. Um, in that example, the irregular challenge was part of the great power challenge, right? The Spanish empire was deteriorating and falling apart. The British empire was ascendant in the Caribbean. The Spanish were afraid that the British were going to invade Cuba and take it over. The British were afraid that if they didn't, the Americans might invade Cuba and take it over. The Spanish didn't want any of this to happen because Cuba and Puerto Rico were their two most lucrative economic arms of their empire, really the only part of the empire left. This was great power competition, you know, by definition. And the counter-piracy campaign that the Americans launched and that the Royal Navy uh, also conducted, I was going to say joined, but joined is the wrong phrase because it, it sounds like they were super coordinated and they weren't. Tactically, sometimes they were, but strategically they weren't. These were all operations conducted within those auspices of great power competition, that these great powers were struggling with each other in the Caribbean Sea. Um, so this idea that somehow... Uh, we have, on the one hand, irregular or maritime security challenges and crime that is faced, and on the other hand, we have a, a, a great power issue, and these two things don't mix. No, they, they in the history, they have explicitly mixed. The, the, the irregular is part of how the great powers interact with each other when they don't want to go to full-fledged open warfare. Um, so the second historical element, that same campaign, what happens... Well, first, the U.S. Navy sends a frigate down and some sloops, some deep draft vessels that can't get in close to the shallows, that spend an entire season in the Caribbean, and the frigate doesn't even run across a single pirate, even though there are 300 piracy events in that year. <laughs> <laughs> so the next year, the Board of Naval Commissioners is asked by the SECNAV, hey, guys, what do we do? And they come up with an idea. And there's this fascinating uh, document from the archives where they give their report to SECNAV where... Uh, they break it down by dollars and cents. Here is the cost of a frigate. Here is the cost of an armament of a frigate. Here is the cost of the crew of a frigate. Here is the cost of going to Baltimore and buying 10 schooners. Here is the cost of buying guns to put on those 10 schooners. Probably small three and six pounders. And a, you know maybe half a dozen to a dozen on each ship, not a lot. Here is the cost for manning those 10 schooners. Guess what? cheaper than a frigate. And they establish what they call the Mosquito Squadron. It joins the newly founded West Indies Squadron. David Porter leads it down into the Caribbean. In the first year, piracy drops by two-thirds because they're able to get in shallow. They're able to conduct these raids on pirate camps in Cuba and in Puerto Rico, and they're able to conduct maritime security operations in a way that that deep draft frigate simply could not and they're saving the Navy money. One ship, no, instead they have 10. Um, so that's the history, that's an example from the history that we might want to consider today. Josh, uh, so I'll, with respect to the, the training and uh, equipping question, which I think DJ really touched on, and I think his book is, is replete with, with fascinating examples of, of general purpose forces not being necessarily satisfactorily equipped and finding fascinating workarounds to, to get access to the small draft uh, and the small boats that they need in order to conduct the inland and the coastal operations. So I think there's inevitably a training and equipping element to this. But I, as a, I guess I'll operate a little bit more, I guess, in, in the theory space, I do think that there is a fundamental conceptual challenge that needs to be addressed first. Right? If we don't, similar to what, what Steve said, if we don't get to the why, then the how and, and the means we're just going to go in circles or we're going to spend good money after bad. So they're, they're related. I don't think one is necessarily more important than the other, but there is a sequencing that is relevant to make sure that we know why we are buying something to do what, to generate what effect. And then I'll, I'll skip to the third question, uh, which, is, which I think sort of speaks to who's, whose job is this. And there are different ways of phrasing, phrasing that that come with both a different normative judgment and also real consequences for the international system. So we're either talking about burden sharing, which kind of comes with, with capacity building, or we're talking about retrenchment. And I would not be in favor of retrenchment. I think there's, and this is a debate the whole country's having right now, which is 
what is the role of the United States in upholding the international system and what does it do for us fundamentally? I think it's valuable for the United States and particularly to Martin's point about this sea blindness that, that's, that this current generation has because we're so removed from the sea. We generate a lot of value from controlling and enforcing positive, liberal in the international sense, rules about the economy at sea. We should play a role in that. There's no reason per both BJ's conclusions and the ones that I have in my book that this should not be partnership oriented. It, it fundamentally should be, both for the aesthetics of it, but also the efficacy. But I think we should differentiate that burden sharing has a strong positivity to, positivity to it, at least from my perspective, but retrenchment pulls us out of the game at, at just the wrong time. Linda Robinson. Um, so I would like to uh, try to answer the broad question here that there needs to be a paradigm shift to acknowledge that we're in a fight right now, and that fight's called a regular warfare, but our system is very much geared toward a mental model of World War II. And while there is needed investment in, uh, our, in modernization for the services uh, to match and, and exceed what Russia and China, the primary adversaries, are doing, that is not where the fight's happening right now. And once that realization uh, would occur, I think you would see some shifts in investment. Um, and, and with regard to the small craft, uh, Otto, I think that is we have the um, SOCOM funding line so it can purchase its small craft or modify those service uh, supplied uh, craft. But I think especially as you're starting to see thinking about swarming, and I'll use counter swarming, <laughs> um, they're, they're probably, if we take seriously the fight that's going on now, uh, might drive some investments, whether it's um, marine or aerial swarming. You know, there are all kinds of ideas uh, that the next generation technology is going to take a regular warfare in uh, that direction. We're wrestling with that in, in the cyberspace. So I think we're, we're really begging for a paradigm shift to take the language of the NDS into what is actually happening with the budget and programs and strategy, the operational plans of the uh, Pentagon and indeed the whole government. And then that leads me to the Office of uh, Irregular Warfare. So this has existed since the DOD Directive on Irregular Warfare was promulgated, I believe, 2007. And I know Peter will correct me if I'm wrong, but we, we then, they set up this um, office that is housed in the Joint Staff J7, so a three-star in charge of it, and its counterpart is the Assistant Secretary of Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict. So it has high-level, uh, relatively high-level uh, um, leadership, and then it's an executive steering committee that others within the Pentagon uh, sit within it. Uh, but I think there's still a gap, and there's, I think, partly because people are so focused on gaining uh, funding for major platforms and preserving end strength or growing end strength, this risks falling off the radar screen when it's actually the fight we should be uh, focused on, in my opinion. Martin. Yeah, I, I think if we, when, as and when we see the Navy buying small ships, we'll know that the Navy has got it. It's, um, <laughs> it, it understands where the real fight's going to be taking place. Um, and they'll need it for two reasons. They'll need it certainly if we're going to engage with uh, allies and partners, uh, especially at this low level of war, because the ships that we can deploy are completely the wrong size and they'll, they'll be designed for a completely different mission. But also, when you transit from this irregular, so more so-called irregular warfare, political warfare, as I prefer to call it, um, that is happening at sea in the South China Sea and, and, and elsewhere, and you see it mutate into larger great power conflict, we're going to need a lot more smaller ships anyway, uh, distributed ships, autonomous ships, anything that it becomes a very, very small target, and in multiples. So we, 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 we give the enemy a much harder targeting problem. So small ships uh, has to be the way it goes. Um, the, when it comes to the naval irregular warfare office, I'll move quickly onto that. That presumably was the, the small, the mini-me to the joint office. Um, and I think, I'll be perfectly blunt, I think it was set up because the Navy had, had wanted nothing to do with naval irregular warfare. And it was an inside, not even inside the beltway, it was an inside the building um, bureaucratic machine to make sure that the Navy was seen to be doing something without actually having to get involved in it. It didn't last very long. I don't know if it still exists. I'm not sure if it still exists. No, no, I need two admirals. Go ahead. Korea's ended by oh, it. Oh, okay. 
Does it exist? So it is a component under the OPNAV. Okay. Yeah, understand. It's gone down to a desk, has it? Really? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are we finished there, then? Peter, you're sure, going to get the last word. Two, two quick points. One, um, about 2009, I was interviewing a former head of um, Fleet Forces Command, a four star. Uh, and this was 2009. And he said, under no circumstances will I trade an F 18 for any Riverine boats. Um, uh, and uh, echoing Martin's uh, comments, I was, in the bin, I was in the building when uh, when all this was coming uh, along, and, and uh, the Navy was given an OCO budget uh, that they had to relate to CT and COIN, uh, and that's that's what funded a lot of the NECC and a lot of the regular warfare um, uh, kind of capabilities. Uh, from a broader perspective, though, one of the problems, going back to, 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 to something Linda raised, one of the problems is that, is that American strategic culture, Americans view conflict E as we either at war or we're at peace, which, which, which is unusual because in the early part of our, uh, uh, you know, we were a, essentially a regular force during, during the Revolutionary War. Uh, so we're not, uh, and then again in the 1950s with political warfare and George Kennedy, we were very tied to the hip with, with political warfare. Um, the problem now is that we have such a great uh, conventional overmatch that is, that is eroding rapidly that we essentially pushed um, and expanded competition in the gray zone, which what SOCOM calls the gray zone, that is the area between war uh, and peace. And, and, and a lot of problems come about is, is that um, that way of thinking, that dichotic way of thinking is manifested in our instruments of power, in, in Congress, in law, uh, and everything else. It is very difficult for the Treasury Department um, to work with the Navy uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, so we, we've been kind of getting around that the last 15 years or so, 15, 20 years, but now it's, it's broadening to the great power competition scale and, and blowing up well past the CT and, and, and coin scale. Uh, and the fact is we're, we're scrambling to be able to, to fix those problems. We're fixing those problems on a day-to-day -day basis, and they really come down to authorities and what Congress can, can, uh, can allot. Uh, and one of the reasons why special operations has been turned to for the last 20 years or so is they know how to operate in the area, they are very good at, in that area, and they and they present a uh, you know a low risk approach uh, that for for risk averse uh, politicians. So it's it's this is going to take some time for the United States in the great power competition, particularly with China, to be able to uh, think about how we need to change structurally, uh, and then and then normatively a, as well. Well, our five speakers today I think have done a brilliant job of trying to explain what I why I organized this session, which is this really matters for the larger great power context. It matters for everything outside of the great power context. Um, we're in the era of irregular political warfare. Uh, our Navy and our maritime forces, including the Coast Guard, which hasn't got much play here, uh, need to be part of this, um, working with allies and partners. I'm looking forward to writing more about this, but I hope uh, you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Please, uh, in addition to thanking my Hudson colleagues who did a brilliant job of organizing this today, Please thank our speakers.